Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, uh, today we will start with a new topic on uh, dynamic recrystallization. So, we have covered microstructural evolution in this particular module, then dynamic recovery, okay, a very important uh, microstructural change which takes place in the material during hot deformation is through dynamic recrystallization, okay. And in that, uh, uh, the, the smaller topic which we will be covering is discontinuous dynamic recrystallization. So, basically dynamic recrystallization there can be three types of dynamic recrystallization which we will be covering one by one. In that discontinuous dynamic recrystallization is the first one which we are going to cover. Then the next one is continuous dynamic recrystallization and the geometric dynamic recrystallization. Actually most of the studies and uh, the mo modeling of uh, or numerical modeling or analytical modeling is done on the discontinuous dynamic recrystallization. So, initially uh, that was the most uh, important uh, uh, microstructural changes which people uh, saw and understood. Okay. The continuous dynamic recrystallization is the later addition to the dynamic recrystallization okay. and uh, we will try to understand that why now it has become important. So, if we look at the discontinuous dynamic recrystallization. Uh, of, uh, also, sometime you will uh, come to know it as a classical model or classical uh, dynamic recrystallization. Okay. And uh, the difference between the, the, the main important uh, characteristic of this kind of recrystallization is it is through nucleation and growth. Okay. So, recrystallization means uh, uh, a new strain free grain will grow in a deformed matrix. Okay. So, when we are putting deformation basically what we are doing we are putting dislocation. So, dislocation density is increasing in the material. So, the strain energy is increasing in the material okay. and the later the material want to bring down its free energy. Okay. So, what it will try to do is it will try to nucleate a new strain free grain within this strained matrix okay. and this will grow. Okay, and later on the whole matrix should be covered by this uh, relatively strain free new grains. Okay. So, this is what is the recrystallization, okay. uh, crystal, uh, uh, formation of this new strain free grains in the uh, strain grains. Okay. So, it is not a phase transformation, the same phase will be uh, getting a new set of uh, you can say grain or new set of cloths. Okay. So, primary mechanism is, is nucleation and growth. So, you can uh, uh, kind of uh, compare with or you can easily understand this particular recrystallization with the diffusional phase transformation. So, in diffusional phase transformation also you will see a similar kind of uh, kinetics and the behavior uh, of uh, how the recrystallization progresses will be similar to how phase transformation progresses. In phase transformation, of course, it will be a new phase which is forming in the older phase as, as you might be knowing uh, in, ca in case of steel uh, ferrite nucleates from austenite. Okay. Similarly, in this case, the new strain free grains will nucleate in the strained grains. Okay. So, it is very similar to the diffusional phase transformation. Uh, if you remember in dynamic recovery, we said that in uh, high staking fault energy material, okay, the recovery is more efficient means dislocation can be recovered very easily. Okay. But in a low staking fault energy, there is not much driving force for uh, recovery. Okay. So, disloca dislocation accumulation takes place. So, in low staking fault, fault energy material where the dislocation accumulation takes place, recovery is not very efficient and when the dislocation density will increase, okay, you will have recrystallization. So, the recrystallization phenomena you will usually observe in a 
low staking fault energy materials like copper, nickel and austenitic steels. Okay. So, what is the mechanism of dynamic crystallization? Uh, as I told you, uh, basically nucleation of new strain free grains takes place okay. and where it will uh, nucleate or where this will nucleate as in case of phase transformation if you uh, know the new ferrite grains will nucleate at the prior austenite grain boundaries. Okay. So, it, similarly in this case the nucleation of new strain free grains will take place at the prior high angle grain boundaries okay. and uh, around that you have uh, dislocation density. So, that is where it will start and because it will start at those boundaries okay, it kind of form what uh, people call it as a necklace structure. So, if you can understand suppose we if we take only the equiaxed kind of grain okay, something like this. Okay. So, if uh, you can have the nucleate the high angle grain boundary like this, okay, you can see that it looks like a necklace. Okay. So, this is what we call as a necklace, necklace structure of equiax grains form on the high angle boundaries, high angle grain boundaries and uh, uh, how you will observe that it has started or uh, if a nucleation has started that the bulging at the grain boundary starts first okay, before dynamic recrystallization you will have a kind of a bulge uh, on the boundary and that particular new strain free grain then will grow. Okay, so, you will have a bulging at the grain boundary and this bulging and this strain free grain will then grow in the uh, in the strained matrix. Okay. So, that way it looks very similar to strain induced grain boundary migration. So, in strain induced means you have a driving force for grain boundary migration this high angle grain boundary migration because of the difference in the strain energy in the where you have a higher dislocation density and in this case where a new strain free grain is growing is starting nucleating and then growing okay, and that will be a, a, a dislocation free kind of uh, grain. Okay. So, this strain energy uh, difference is the driving force for the uh, mo uh, mobility of the grain boundary and that is why it is uh, also similar to a strain induced grain boundary migration. Now, growth of uh, recrystallized nuclei, okay, if you see the growth uh, 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 schematic diagram is there. Okay. So, at A is your the new newly formed recrystallized grain the boundary of that which is growing. Okay. So, if you see in terms of dislocation density where this grain boundary is the dislocation density is very low. Just ahead of that okay, just ahead of this boundary which is moving okay, a bulge which is moving okay, you have a dislocation density of the matrix. Okay. So, this is very high dislocation density okay, which is in the matrix. So, this interface is seeing this kind of high dislocation density at the grain boundary of course, because it is a strain free grain which is uh, supposed to grow and that boundary is growing. So, it is uh, having the low, lowest dislocation density and as you can see the dislocation density is again increasing. So, what happens if you are keep deforming the material and recrystallization is happening in the material. So, these new strain free grains okay, they will again accumulate the dislocation. So, it is not like that once this uh, strain free grains are growing okay, and you have a recrystallized microstructure. Uh, again if, if we keep deforming, if we have not stopped the deformation at that point and we are still deforming what will happen that these new grains now will start having deformation okay, or having uh, and because of that the dislocation density will start increasing. So, just at the grain boundary. Okay, where which is moving in the strain matrix you will see that the dislocation density is very low okay, and at any particular distance x you will see that the dislocation density is rho sub x okay, and of course, the dislocation density will again keep increasing and then may, may, may be it will reach the present dislocation density of the matrix as, as is shown here. Okay. 
Now, what is the condition for nucleation? Okay, so critical value for nucleation to happen during recrystallization, okay, uh, is uh, this particular ratio, okay, that is the dislocation density in the matrix uh, raised to cube divided by the strain rate. This particular value, okay, should be more than the material properties here. For example, this gamma B is your uh, grain boundary energy, M is the mobility of the grain boundary, okay. L is the, uh, the slip distance of the dislocation. Okay. So, I will just write it down here, mobility of the grain boundary, okay. L is your slip distance of dislocation. Okay, G, G is your shear modulus, B is of course your Burgers vector, okay, and this is your energy of grain boundary, okay. So, uh, as we can understand that in material with high staking fault energy, they have a better recovery, the dislocation recover very efficiently. That is why you can see that the dislocation accumulation is not there and the dislocation density will not reach the critical value which is required for nucleation. Okay. So, however, uh, as we already know that aluminum is a high staking fault energy material and uh, it should show uh, efficiently dynamic recovery. But sometimes uh, some researchers have seen in pure aluminum also they have seen the di discontinuous dynamic recrystallization. Okay. That means recovery has not taken place, the dislocation has accumulated okay. and then the new strain free grains are growing through nucleation and growth mechanism. Okay. Uh, that is probably due to when you have a very pure, this, this is usually people have observed in pure aluminum, very pure aluminum, okay. maybe 99.999 percent purity. So, in those material actually the mobility of the grain boundary is very high because there are no solute atoms or precipitate to pin the grain boundary. Okay. So, grain boundary can move very easily. Okay. So, the mobility term there is very fast. Okay. So, this ratio is the value of this ratio because m is in the denominator this value of this ratio will be lower. So, you require less dislocation density also to start the uh, nucleation process. Okay. So, either it can be that you have a lower efficiency of recovery so that you can easily reach the high value of dislocation density okay. or you can have a higher mobility of the grain boundary so that this ratio itself has the lower value. So, with a smaller dislocation density also I should be able to reach the that critical value of nucleation. Okay. So, sometime it happens in, in the high staking fault energy material also that you can have uh, uh, recrystallization, dynamic recrystallization instead of dynamic recovery, okay. but uh, th those are very specific cases. Now, as I told you that microstructural evolution if you see okay, in case of dynamic recrystallization. So, as I told you the if you take a particular grain, this is the prior grain okay, which was there before the deformation started. Okay. And now, uh, as the deformation is progressing, you have more dislocation density okay. and also there is a, a, a higher uh, dislocation density in general. If you see uh, how the dislocation are distributed within the grain, you will uh, know that the dislocations density is more close to the grain boundary as compared to the grain interior. So, there is also a gradient between of dislocation density from grain interior to the grain boundary okay. uh, that you will uh, know through also geometric uh, uh, geometrically necessary dislocation which are has to be there in the material. Okay. So, you have a higher dislocation density at the at the grain boundary 
okay, and the lower de dislocation density within the grain. Now, since the dislocation density is high as well as the you have high angle grain boundaries, so when you start a nucleation process, okay, it can be easily done on a high energy site here. Okay. So, because of that you have uh, all the nuclei which forms at the grain boundary okay, and it gives you a typical necklace type of structure. Okay. And as the it progresses it will completely cover the whole, whole high angle grain boundary, the prior high angle grain boundary okay, and you have large number of equiex nuclei okay, in this second image okay, and then it will progress within the grain. Okay. And after some time it will be able to cover the whole matrix okay. and uh, then this particular grains also will start growing. Okay. So, there, is, there will be grain growth here after the recrystallization. So, you have very fine equiex microstructure here, okay. but as you know the grain growth process is that the bigger grain grow at the expense of smaller grains. So, slowly you will have a grain growth process also associated with that. Okay. So, you can see after certain time the grain growth has taken place and that initial grain is now subdivided into this small uh, grain okay. that is the recrystallization process. Okay. You can also see a nice micrograph here which shows the, um, the start of the nucleation process okay, at the grain boundary. So, this must have been the prior grain boundary in the material okay. and something like this okay. and you can see that large number of nuclei, nuclei are present here okay, at the grain boundary. So, this is a copper uh, deformed at 400 degree Celsius at this particular strain rate okay. and very nicely you can see that how this recrystallization has, is happening at the grain boundary. Now, since the recrystallization is taking place, okay, so of course, it will also affect the grain size of the material. Okay. So, if you want to measure the steady state grain size means after the recrystallization the steady state which is taking place. Okay. So, steady state grain size if you measure okay, that decreases monotonically with stress and has weak dependence on temp temperature. So, Okay, it, it is actually strongly dependent on the stress and weak dependence on the temperature. So, you can see on the x axis I have normalized grain size that is the d divided by b the Berger's factor. Similarly, on the y axis I have normalized stress. So, stress is divided by shear modulus. Okay, this we try to do to kind of bring uh, data of different material in one graph. So, you can see that uh, the material which are plotted here it is steel, iron, nickel, copper, magnesium, uh, sodium chloride, uh, Fe, uh, ferrous uh, sulphate or uh, sulphide FeS, NONO3, olivine, ice. Okay. So, you can also understand that this kind of deformation or recrystallization and all these microstructural changes takes place in case of ice. Olivin is one kind of mineral. Okay. So, in, in different type of materials you can see the same deformation behavior okay. and uh, that the normalized grain size okay, as you can see and that this is normalized stress. So, as my stress is decreasing the stress value is decreasing my grain size the grain size which I am going to get okay, that is increasing. Okay. So, stress is decreasing and grain size is increasing. If you remember uh, earlier also we related the grain size in case of dynamic recovery there we talk about sub grain size that we related with the, uh, the zener holoman parameter okay. and this zero zener holoman parameter is also uh, you can relate the stress with the zener holoman parameter. Okay. So, more or less the, the, the things are same okay, that uh, when stress or you can say zener holoman parameter is coming down, okay, your grain size is going to be more. Okay. And we also know that when the z will be low okay, 
at lower strain rate and higher temperatures. Of course, the, the temperature dependence is weak here, but still we can take it as a parameter. So, at higher uh, lower strain rate, okay, so sigma low, z low, that means strain rate low, temperature high. Okay, so, uh, lower strain rate and higher temperature. Okay, so, lower strain rate means that uh, as we uh, have seen the in the nucleation equation also the strain rate was in the denominator that when you bring down the strain rate, okay, you, your generation of dislocation density will be that much slower. Okay. So, you will attain a larger grain size, the steady state grain size will be more, the grain size which you get after recrystallization will be more. Similarly, at high temperature mobility will be more, okay. similarly driving force will be more, okay. you will have higher grain size as you go toward the lower stresses. Okay. So, this is the dependence between the uh, what you get as grain size after recrystallization and the stress values. Now, uh, there is another very important uh, characterization technique as I told you earlier also that is electron backscatter diffraction EBSD. Okay. And uh, why I was taking that here is that this is one of the very important technique now to characterize the recrystallization process in the material. Okay. And uh, as I told you that in this particular technique, okay, actually you find out the orientation of each grain. Okay. So, basically orientation of the unit cell that how the unit cell is oriented in different grains. Okay. Now, when I am trying to do that, suppose I take a grain here. Okay. Okay. Now, if this grain does not have any subgrain, does not have any uh, large dislocation density okay? and suppose I want to know the orientation of unit cell at every point. Okay? Suppose I am just looking from the top right now okay? and I am looking in the, so, so this is my 100 zero zero, let us say, this is my 0 1 0. So, 0 0 1 is coming up. Okay? So, if I do this measurement and I measure the or I find out the orientation of the unit cell in each part of the grain, okay, it will be same, it, there will not be any change in the way the unit cell is oriented because in each grain uh, within a grain it will should have the same orientation. Okay. But if I do the same measurement now, in a grain which is deformed. Okay. Now, you will have subgrain. So, sub what subgrain will, will do? Subgrain when subgrain form or subgrain boundary is there, there will be slight change in the orientation of the unit cell. Okay. Right now, I would not be able to do it in three dimensions. So, I am doing in two dimensions that how it will be different. So, suppose the unit cell is oriented like this here and suppose there is sub subgrain, maybe the unit cell will slightly misoriented here. Okay. So, the 100 zero zero, let us say was here, now it become like this. Okay. Maybe slowly, slowly, slowly if you see there are some low, very low angle grain boundaries or dislocation network, okay. maybe after a certain distance it will be oriented something like this. Okay, so, there is large number of different variation of orientation of the unit cell. Okay. So, this is I would say you will see in a recrystallized grain because you have removed all the dislocation, it is now dislocation free grain. So, everywhere if I find out the orientation of the unit cell, it should be same. And this is where it is a deformed grain. Okay. Where now the unit cell has different orientation, very slight variation okay, at different part of the grain. Okay. And the grain we have already defined is the one which is uh, enclosed within high angle grain boundaries. Okay. So, this I will call a subgrain because one part is uh, enclosed with a low angle grain boundary. Okay. Within this also you I can have some subgrain as like this which has all the low angle grain boundaries. Okay. So, now the orientation is different at different place. Okay. So, this I can characterize 
what I with what I will call as orientation spread. So I can measure the orientation at different place, okay. And what is the spread in the orientation, okay? So if the spread is more, that means that there is a deformation in the grain, okay. If if the spread is low, okay, that means I have uh, removed the dislocation. I have recovered, uh, recrystallized the structure, okay. And that is how I can find out the uh, what is the uh, microstructural condition at a particular uh, after a particular deformation okay so this growing orientation spread is a very important parameter to uh, characterize quickly the material that how the recrystallization is progressing as a function of deformation so this is one uh, very nice microstructure is shown here taken from papers okay and here they have have grain orientation spread map after hot compression at 500 degrees celsius at a strain rate of 0.01 per second okay and after true strain of 0 0.2 so this is after 0 0.2 this is after 0 0.5 this is after 0 0.8 and this is after 1.0 okay and the criteria which they have taken that grain orientation spread should be less than 1.3 degree that way they will consider as recrystallized okay so all this blue portion is recrystallized okay so they have taken a 200 uh, micron uh, is shown as the scale here so let's say around 400 or 500 micron uh, image is in x direction and maybe around in y direction it will be 300 400 micron okay and you can see that how it is progressing from here to here to here okay that the recrystallization fraction is continuously increasing as you are putting more and more strain okay so you can understand that recrystallization also can is as a function of strain it will increase okay it lower strain you have a lower fraction as you increase the strain more and more grains are recrystallizing and uh, later on the your most of the microstructure will have these blue grains blue means somewhere here okay below 1.3 as they are saying that uh, all the grains are now colored blue okay so this is one of the very important technique to uh, characterize the uh, uh, microstructure uh, in terms of recrystallization so i just wanted to tell you this here okay so what we have discussed now is that what is the dynamic recrystallization okay and that particularly we have right now seen the discontinuous dynamic recrystallization which uh, happens by nucleation and growth mechanism okay so and uh, we have also seen that the dynamic recrystallization is uh, is is usually takes place in the material with low staking fault energy okay so when you have low staking fault energy material the dislocation density will keep increasing uh, because the the recovery is slower recovery is not very efficient in this material okay and then you will have a recrystallization process at certain strain okay and you can also see here that as a function of a strain that how the recrystallization fraction will increase okay and almost whole of the material will be uh, covered with the recrystallized microstructure okay so with that uh, i think this uh, particular part is over now in the next lecture we will discuss about the uh, that how i can identify the recrystallization from the flow stress curve right now we have seen the microstructural features and how the microstructure will look like in a dynamic recrystallized material okay next we will see the same thing in the in terms of uh, flow stress or stress strength curve okay thank you